Today we're going to talk about fire protection systems. We're going to cover in one chapter what the class called uh, 155 covers in a whole semester. So this is going to be a flyover. We're going to go through it really quick and uh, I hope you will be able to view this okay. I'm trying this for the first time and going to make it a video. So as usual, I like to start with a quote. Actually, I've got a, a set of quotes here from the great coach John Wooden from UCLA basketball. If you aren't uh, familiar with him, Google him. Most successful college basketball coach in history. Um, an amazing, amazing man. He talked a lot about uh, letting go of the past and looking forward to what you can do something about, and that's today and the future. So uh, he said here, don't let yesterday take up too much of today. In fact, don't worry about things you can't control because they may adversely affect the things you can control. You know, there's a lot of people that spend a time uh, moaning and groaning over their situation and uh, about mistakes of the past and, and uh, the, their uh, set up in life. And you know what? <laughs> you can't change that. You are what you are. So work hard with what you've got. That's what he's saying. In fact, he says, don't let what you can't do interfere with what you can do. He put that all into one very powerful statement here. Let me read it for you. So discipline yourself. Focus on the here and now without allowing yourself to become distracted by days gone by. Love and help your fellow man to succeed without any expectation of remuneration. That means like money. Plan every day as if it matters because each day does. Give every single day your best effort, and you will make each day your masterpiece. He used to say that a lot. Make today a masterpiece. So, um, you know, I knew a kid that uh, I was talking to him, and he hadn't finished high school. He didn't have a driver's license, and he was like 21, 22 years old. And I asked him, what do you, what do, you do with your day? Well, I play uh, World of Warcraft. I said, how much? Oh, eight to ten hours a day. Now, that's not making each day a masterpiece. That's just wasting your life. So, if you want to be a firefighter, or if you want to just at least succeed in life, forget the past, move forward to the future, make today a masterpiece, give your all to everything you do. That's how you're going to be a successful person and hopefully succeed in your pursuit of being a firefighter. Well, let's start talking about fire protection systems. When I was an inspector, there were two schools that I inspected that had dormitories that were very similar. They were uh, concrete tilt-up or um, concrete block with brick. Both of them were basically fire-resistant buildings uh, type 3, but inside they had old antiquated alarms and they didn't have sprinkler systems. And uh, inside they had a lot of fire load. And I kept telling them, you guys need to do something about this. These are very uh, dangerous dormitories. Uh, I know both schools did not allow smoking in the rooms, but the students, they, they were battery-operated um, fire smoke detectors and they would just uh, you know take them down take out the battery and smoke in their bedrooms cook in their bedrooms make popcorn in their bedrooms all sorts of things that had the potential for starting a fire well when they kind of gave me a bad time about the way I was pressuring them I brought up Seton Hall Seton Hall University uh, had a dormitory for freshmen called the Boland Hall Dormitory uh, on January 19th in 2000, in the very early part of the morning at 4.30, there was a fire that killed three students. Four were severely burned. There were 58 injuries. 
And one of the reasons why the fire was so bad is that the students were used to false alarms. Um, it was a constant thing because people would make popcorn in their uh, microwaves and they try to get those last couple of kernels popped and it would smoke and cause the smoke detectors to go off so people ignored them. There were no sprinklers there. Well, how did this fire start? Well, Sean Ryan and Joseph Lapore, those uh, guys in the bottom of your picture, or bottom picture of your slide, they were uh, party animals. They used to stay up into the wee hours of the morning drinking, and they were in the common area playing pool or foosball or something and drinking and making a bunch of noise. Some students in uh, rooms nearby complained to him, got really pissed off, yelled at him. And uh, so Sean and Joseph decided they would let those guys have it. And I, I hope that it was not just a bad decision, but maybe a drunken decision, which there's no excuse at all. But they decided that the way to get back at these guys is they were going to set the bulletin board on fire that was right outside these guys' uh, dormitory room. So they set this paper on fire and uh, something happened they didn't expect. It spread really fast. It caught the furniture on fire. Things started spreading and the smoke detectors went off and they ran out of the dormitory um, you know, like cowards. Now, most of the people that uh, were burned and injured, it was because they delayed in exiting and they were ignoring these alarms. Dana Christmas, this, uh, what a interesting name, because she's the one who saved all the lives. Uh, they call her the Angel of Boland Hall. She was a resident uh, assistant or a dorm assistant uh, R-A-D-A, and uh, she she was responsible to check on alarms, and when she opened the door and there was smoke in the hallways and the heat was building up, she started running up and down the hallway and uh, pounding on doors and yelling, it, it's a real alarm, it's a real fire, get out, escape, escape. And she did this while her skin was burning, and uh, she ran back into her room, cooled herself off with water, and then went back out in the hall and pounded on more doors and saved more lives. She was quite severely burned, but not as bad as uh, two other young men. Uh, in fact, you can click on the link there. It's kind of hard to see. I don't know why it printed out in purple there. But if you click on that link, uh, you'll get a little YouTube uh, about a book that was written by two of the guys that were severely burned. Uh, their their story is pretty powerful. But, you know, this whole thing could have turned out better um, if there were better alarms and if there were fire sprinklers. By the way, uh, both of the arsons uh, did go to jail and were uh, prosecuted for manslaughter. So as we talk about fire protection systems and how they could save lives, we're going to look at the different kinds, a little bit of the history behind it, uh, some of the principles behind it. We're going to talk about the basically the three kinds of fire protection systems, detection systems, smoke control systems, and extinguishing systems. Uh, so uh, we're also going to talk about pumps a little bit, but we're, we'll just speed through that part. It's, it's kind of a little boring. Um, so let's get at it. Um, let's remember the history of firefighting in Rome, uh, New Amsterdam, later New York, and other places. There were different things uh, that they did to deal with the problems of fire. We talked about that um, in the first week. So what were those, some of those main things that they did to deal with the problems of fire? And what concepts did we learn from those early attempts to control fire? Well, first of all, they realized that early detection is essential. Uh, in the conflagrations in Rome, London, New Amsterdam, they, as a response, implemented a fire watch program. So they would have people going around with bells or rattles to 
let go an alarm to alert the public because most of the fires would happen at night. Uh, second concept, they realized the faster you get fire suppressant, which usually is going to be water, uh, on the fire, the better. So bucket brigades led to volunteer fire departments. Um, bucket brigades led to uh, hose pumps and uh, to steam engines and eventually to our modern fire engine. And then thirdly, they realized the people aren't going to do the things to prevent fires unless we make them. So we needed codes to implement fire prevention. Uh, so there were some inventions. Remember, I talked about how a public outcry leads to most of the code, but also over the ages, technology and inventions have led to the code. And uh, a great example is a guy named uh, Sir William Congreve. Um, you may not, you know, you're probably thinking, who the heck is he? Well, you actually have, uh, you are aware of his invention. He was the inventor of the Congreve rocket. And the Congreve rocket was a, uh, a device that was used by the British military in battle. And that's what we are singing about when we see the, sing the Star Spangled ba Banner. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in, in air. Those rockets were Congreve rockets. Now, he was uh, an inventor of all sorts of things, and he owned some businesses, and he was very concerned about fire in the mills. And so he patented an idea for pipes that ran through a building and a valve that you would uh, turn or, or you know, might be a push-pull kind of a valve that when it was turned on, water ran into the pipe and in the pipe there were holes and the water would come out of the holes and hopefully, uh, if not suppress the fire, slow it down. Well, that was the first real invention or patented invention uh, for fire sprinklers. Now, later, all the way in 1874, a guy named Henry Parmalee, he invented the first fire sprinkler head and said, instead of just having holes in the pipe, uh, let's, let's create a sprinkler head where it comes out and it deflects off of this head and the water spreads into a, a greater area. And uh, a guy named Grinnell also invented uh, advancements on Parmalee's idea and uh, the NFPA put together, eventually in the 1890s, I believe it was, um, standards for fire sprinklers. Uh, in 1852, um, fire alarm boxes were invented and started to show up in the bigger cities like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago. And these fire alarm boxes use telegraph technology to send a message to the fire station as to the neighborhood or the general location of where the, the fire box was. Now, this was better than people having to run all the way to the fire station, um, but it still wasn't like our modern fire prevention or uh, uh, fire alarms. The, the fire alarm boxes only let them know the neighborhood. They would go to the neighborhood and then hopefully they'd see smoke or that people would meet them and show them where the fire was. So it led the firefighters to the area, but uh, now we have much more modern ways of, of doing that. So why should we worry about uh, fire protection systems? Well, you know what? Not only as fire inspectors, but... Fire protection systems reduce fire deaths and injuries, and, and this includes the firefighters. If we have a fire sprinkler system, it reduces the chances of flashover, and therefore flashover doesn't happen right before or right after firefighters arrive. So fire protection systems serve three main purpose, purposes. And we kind of referred to this already. Early detection and identification of the location of the fire. Um, controls the fire by putting suppressant on the seat of the fire. Delays flashover. And then thirdly, removes smoke and heat, giving more time for people to evacuate and also to delay or prevent flashover. 
There's other benefits, um, of course, occupant life safety, firefighter safety, uh, improved firefighting efficiency, um, and uh, the money. It mitigates risk, therefore conserving property, and of course the insurance companies are happy with that because it saves them money. So, as I said, there's three basic types, detection and alarm, smoke control, and suppression systems. And of the suppression systems, there's two basic types, water-based and special agent-based. Let's start with uh, fire protection extinguishing systems. Now, the water-based ones, there's four basic types, uh, automatic sprinkler, and those we're all very familiar with, but the next three, uh, next two are not as common, water mist and foam. Foam systems are kind of cool, and uh, on the our homepage on Canvas, we see uh, a picture of a foam system that has been operated. Uh, and then the fourth kind of water-based systems is standpipes, which are there mostly for firefighters to be able to fight the fire and uh, have access to... Um, water more readily in high-rises and large buildings. And then uh, the special agent systems, there's dry cam, wet cam, clean agent, carbon dioxide, and portable extinguishers. Now, fire protection systems are expensive, so how are we going to ensure that they're installed? Ah, the code. Uh, we're going to make them. So the California Building and Fire Codes, Title 24, uh, are going to tell us the what, when, and where for the building fire protection systems. They're, they're going to say you got to put it in in these kind of buildings or these kind of occupancies. Now what tells us the details as to how they should be built? Remember that? The fire code tells us what to do. The standards tell us how to do it. So if we were looking at fire alarms, we would go to NFPA 72, National Fire Alarm Code, and we might also use the uh, electrical code. If it was sprinklers, it would be NFPA 13. And th there's, there's a standard for almost every type of fire protection system. So again, uh, let's get back to alarm systems. Three basic components of a fire alarm system. The FACU, or Fire Alarm Control Unit, that's sometimes called Fire Alarm Control Panel, so FACP. The Initiation or Detection Devices, or the Notification Devices. And you know, this is like our human that was the fire watch. Um, the Fire Alarm Control Unit is like his brains. The Initiation Detection Devices are like his senses or her senses. The nose, the eyes, the hearing, the, the sense that we get, oh, something's wrong, there's a fire. And then the notification devices is like that bell or rattle or shouting out fire. This system is replacing a human fire watch and is uh, actually quite a bit more effective and efficient. So the fire alarm control unit, as I said, is like the brains. It processes all the signals that come from the devices, both those that are input, and then it sends out messages to those that are output. So the detection device sends a message to the brains, and then the brain sends a message to the uh, initiation devices. I'm sorry, the, uh, the notification devices and sets off alarms, bells, strobes, whatever. Um, and not only does the FACU do that, but it also has a digital readout that displays information to assist firefighters when they show up to find out what's wrong, where the problem is. So uh, in the old days, they had these non-coded alarm systems. Uh, it was a um, Now, we still have them a little bit, uh, when we just have a local alarm, when a device sends a signal to an FACU, it puts out a, a, a signal, a, a, a sound, but it doesn't um, identify where the problem is. And these are uh, small occupancies. It's just going to make a sound or put off strobes 
to alert people in the building. Uh, so these are local alarms. Um, there's no message that goes to the fire department or to a monitoring company. So um, a non-coded alarm system might be as simple as a smoke detector in your home that's battery operated, it senses the smoke, and then it puts out an alarm sound. Uh, back in the, gosh, I think it was the 50s or 60s, they started coming up with zone or enunciated alarms. Now, this was a step in the right direction, not as good as what we have in uh, modern digital systems today, but it gave you a general lo location. So when the firefighters showed up, they'd go to the panel and they'd see this. And each one of these little uh, red lights that you can see on this panel in the picture uh, indicate a zone. So um, they would see which one is flashing, and then above it, it would be written uh, Building A. So they would know to go to Building A. And they may not know the specific room, but they know the general building on a larger facility. So um, in large manufacturing locations or um, uh, places with lots of buildings or, or lots of size, this would help firefighters get to the seat of the fire or at least find out what was causing the, uh, the alarm. Nowadays, we have modern addressable alarm systems. These are digital based. They are way, way better than what we used to have. You get a text at the panel that identifies not only the location, but much more specific. So not just the building, the actual room and device. So it might say in the digital readout there on the top of that picture, uh, smoke detector number 12, room 111, building J. So the firefighters are able to get to the, the problem. It reduces their time to locate the emergency. It's really great. They're very, very, uh, very good. Now, uh, a lot of systems have emergency voice alarms in addition to those notification devices where the fire department or uh, personnel in the building that are facilities managers can communicate with the occupants. This is common in high-rise, big hotels, um, places uh, like assembly buildings where it, it, firefighters can communicate with each other or firefighters can communicate with the occupants Tell them things like uh, everybody on floor uh, 22 and up, you need to go to the roof. We're going to try and evacuate you by helicopter. There's two different kinds of this, one way and two way. Now there's another modern thing that we have that's kind of cool is, uh, and if you attend Oxnard Community College in person, you've probably seen this by the front doors, an annunciator panel, which is an extension of the fire alarm control panel. The fire alarm control panel is usually located in a closet or a utility room of some type, uh, oftentimes the electrical room, and it's in a place that's locked up so that people can't play with it because it controls everything. This panel doesn't control, this one here, the annunciator panel, doesn't control it. It just gives firefighters, when they walk in the door, it's going to show everything that's showing on the digital readout on the FACU. So it's usually near the main entrance, and usually there's a map of the complex nearby, and then they can read this panel, they can silence it from this panel, they can reset it from this panel, but they can't change anything else from this panel. It takes a technician at the fire alarm control panel to enter or uh, delete devices, things like that. This just helps firefighters by getting the information to them even faster so that they can find out where the fire is. Every alarm system needs a primary power, which is going to come from the electrical. 
uh, and it'll be tied into the electrical panel like everything else in the building, but they're also required to have secondary power, which is usually going to be batteries, but in larger buildings it might be generators. So we talked about that they're uh, also initiating devices. So these uh, are the devices that are going to send a message to the fire alarm control panel to, to tell them that something's wrong. Now, usually they're hardwire signal. We're starting to see more um, Bluetooth radio signal type devices, but uh, this is still having limitations. And those of you who've maybe uh, added uh, security uh, devices to your home, it's great as long as your wireless is working well. I don't know about you, but mine shuts out every once in a while, uh, breaks down. So there's a little bit of more uh, issues with reliability with the radio signals. It's better to use hardwire. So here's some of your different devices, uh, pictures of them. Um, there's uh, smoke detectors, heat detectors, manual poles, and uh, the fire alarm control panels that they would send their messages to. So manual uh, fire alarm boxes are exactly that. Human beings have to initiate them, so occupants operate them. Um, and they're effective as long as the building's occupied. The problem is when it's not occupied, there's nothing automatic. So in a lot of places, uh, they put in heat and smoke detectors, flame detectors, gas detectors. Uh, the first is heat detectors. Um, they uh, initiate at a fixed temperature or at a rate of rise. So the fixed temperature ones would, uh, at let's say 350 degrees, it's going to go off. The rate of rise ones are going to notice a a a rise of temperature from a lower temp to a fixed temperature in a certain amount of time. So if we go from 250 to 350 in a certain amount of time, it's going to initiate the alarm. So heat detectors will detect a flaming fire faster than a smoke detector, but they cost more, and there are other issues with heat detectors most common device is smoke detectors. Uh, they're not as fast, but they're still really fast. Within 30 seconds, it's going to detect a building fire. And um, if you notice that the smoke detectors, they have a larger hole. That's one of the ways to tell if something is a heat detector or a smoke detector. Smoke detectors need some a passing of air to sample uh, the the particulates in the air. That's what they're going to sense. And so there's photoelectric, ionization, air sampling, and there is projected beam that you will see with smoke systems where there's laser beams and when particles are floating in the air they break that uh, laser beam and it will sense that and set off the, the uh, alarm. There are other types. There's flame detectors, gas detectors. You all have one in your home, carbon monoxide. There's combo detectors. Now there's a couple other types, uh, tamper switches. Tamper switches tell the fire alarm company if somebody is turning off the system. So if you were an arson, you'd want to shut down the fire sprinkler system if you wanted to burn a building down. So if you start shutting down the fire sprinkler system, it's going to sense that as soon as you turn it a couple of turns, it sends a message to the alarm company telling them that somebody's turning it off. And uh, it will send, they'll send a message either to the owner or to the fire department. There's another kind of device with uh, sprinkler systems that senses when water is flowing through the sprinkler system and will set off the alarm. Every automatic sprinkler system is required to have an automatic alarm system in conjunction with it with a water flow device. Now lastly we have the notification devices and these are going to be uh, the devices that let people in, in the building know that something's wrong. So we have bells, buzzers, horns, uh, recorded messages, strobe lights, uh, speakers so that someone can speak 
from those control rooms that we talked about earlier. Um, mostly we're going to see horns and strobes. That's what's most common and uh, here's a horn strobe on the top picture. Here's a bell with a strobe next to it uh, on the bottom right picture. There are different kinds of systems. There's protected premises which is just local. Uh, the alarm's only going to go off there in the building. It's not going to notify the fire department. You've got to call 911. Uh, there's auxiliary fire alarm systems. There's a proprietary. Proprietary systems are where you have 24-7 security on site. They're allowed to have a system where the alarm goes to the room where uh, someone is supposed to be monitoring the system 24-7. Then they can send security or check into it, and then they call 911. Uh, most firefighter and fire departments don't really like these systems because it delays our getting called to the fire, but um, it's, it's a way uh, for some, some businesses like to have it. They have more control and supposedly it's less expensive. Uh, central monitoring station and remote receiving, uh, central monitoring is where it's going to go directly to the fire department. Remote receiving, it's going to go to a fire alarm company that monitors the system. This is most common. This is what you're going to see most of the time uh, in America today. Now, uh, we move from smoke detection to smoke control. I mean, fire detection to smoke control. Um, in smoke control systems, we're going to see them most of the time in atriums. So anything that has an atrium, like hotels, uh, high-rise buildings, shopping malls, anywhere where smoke uh, can move from one floor to another rapidly or one part of a building to another part of a building easily. So with smoke control systems, we are going to either remove the smoke or we're going to put positive pressure, put fresh air into a stairwell or something like that where we push clean air in to keep the smoke out and to keep people breathing. Um, there are automatic and manual. Most of them are automatic with a manual. Um, manual systems aren't as reliable as an automatic system so most of the time you're going to see automatic Here's a picture of uh, a mall, kind of looks like uh, our Ventura Mall from the top with that little um, ball thing there in the background. Um, and it's very common for these uh, malls to have glass. They want there to be, you know, daylight in the malls. Um, so up in the top in the atrium portion, portion, not portion, um, you'll see something like this. And this is a smoke evacuation system where it's going to pull the smoke out, giving people more time to evacuate. Of course, if the smoke control system turns on, the alarm system is turning on also and alerting people to get out. Okay, extinguishing systems. Uh, uh, we're halfway done, believe it or not. There's a lot to talk about with extinguishing systems. Uh, water-based is the most common, and it does require developing or tying into a water system. So for tying into a water supply system, we need to understand the system, that there's water sources. We're going to have, like here in California, we have aqueducts and reservoirs uh, and systems with tanks. Uh, we want to move that water throughout the community, and any building that has a uh, fire sprinklers, or any kind of a water-based system, we need to get that water to their property. They're going to have to tie into it. So how do they do that? They do it through gravity systems, going from tanks up on a hill, down into the communities, or through direct pumping. Most of the time, you're going to have a combination where there are pumps that pump the water up into tanks, and then it gravity... Uh, gravity's down to, you know, goes down. Uh, water uh, gains approximately a half pound of pressure per foot in elevation. So if you have a hundred foot uh, high tank to the pipe down below, 
it's going to be 50 PSI that's going to be added to that system. Uh, here's a typical picture from the Midwest. They put the water in storage tanks, uh, elevated tanks like this, because they don't have the hills like we do. We're going to put our storage tanks on hills, and it's going to drain from there down into our uh, homes, into the streets, and then into the homes. Now, the fire protection system has to be separated from any fresh water, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, with the uh, water supply throughout our communities, there's both public and private. Uh, sometimes there's private systems that are, have you know, the government always has some kind of oversight over these. Uh, all the systems have to have control valves to be able to um, control the flow of water and to be able to shut it down if they have to work on something. And those valves are uh, broken up into two kinds, indicating, non-indicating. I'll show you some examples in a couple of slides. Of course, in our communities, then, we're going to have fire hydrants, both dry barrel and wet barrel. And, you know, that's kind of obvious. Dry barrels are dry. The water is in the plumbing underground. And when you turn on the dry barrel, it fills the whole barrel with water. Um, you know, you got to be aware with dry barrel hydrants when you become a firefighter. Once you open it, now it's open to the whole hydrant. So if you have multiple heads, you might want to connect a, a gated Y or something like that to the heads you're not using because that way... Uh, if you need to connect more hose to the hydrant, you've got a way to do that. A wet barrel hydrants are wet right up to the top. Now, the difference between wet and dry is going to be our, our local temperatures. So here in Southern California, unless you're up high in the mountains, we're going to have wet barrel. Uh, places like Fraser Park or Big Bear, Lake Arrowhead, they're going to have dry barrel because they have more snow and uh, freezing temperatures. Now, with uh, our sprinkler systems, uh, they're going to be added uh, based on the hazards that it's protecting. So, uh, inspectors will look at the code, and the code tells us that uh, the occupancy classification and the kind of fuel load or, or the stuff that will burn in the building is going to determine whether we have to have a sprinkler system. Once we determine that you have to have it, then we have to figure out, well, how much fire load is there, fuel load, and um, based on that, how much water, well, how, ma how many BTUs is that going to put out, and then how many BTUs uh, could be in the building, then that's how much water is needed to put the fire out. So, um, and it's got to be figured out so that the most remote sprinkler, the one all the way at the end of the building, has to have adequate pressure and adequate gallons per minute to uh, do its job. I mentioned the valves. Uh, some of our indicating types of valves are OS and Y, an outside screw and yoke. Top left, you can see when the screw is out, that means that the valve is open. Post indicator valves, like the bottom left, uh, they have a little window, and in the window it says open or shut. Um, you can also control the water flow by turning this off or on with this device, but it also tells you whether it's on or off. Uh, the one to the bottom right is similar. It's just using a little paddle to show you whether it's open or closed. And then the top... Uh, top right is also like the OS and Y, but it's a wall PIV. So as the water gets distributed throughout our community, it goes underground, under our streets, and then it gets uh, placed, uh, you know, the water company will bring plumbing to the property line. Now from that point on, the owner of the property is responsible to add plumbing. And the plumbing for the fire protection has to be separate from the plumbing for bathrooms, showers, uh, the water we drink, and all of that. So there has to be what is called a backflow device, and it has a clapper valve in it and other valves uh, that suppress water from going from the, the fire protection system back into the public water. 
We don't want to drink that stuff because over time it gets gross. It's smelly. It's black. If you've ever seen a, a sprinkler system turn on, it's black water that comes out. It's really gross. Um, lots of mold and that. Uh, so that uh, backflow device is usually going to be an OS and Y, which is an indicating valve. We need to be able to tell from the street, is the fire sprinkler system on or off? From there, there's going to be a riser that comes out of the ground with all of the devices and pressure gauges that the uh, fire inspector needs to see. Um, then from there, it'll go up into the ceiling area and there'll be plumbing uh, cross mains and uh, branches that go to each one of the sprinkler heads. There's four kinds of sprinkler systems, wet, dry, deluge, and pre -act. Now, uh, if you're a genius, you might have already figured out a wet pipe system. Yeah, it's wet. It has the water already in it. So wet pipe sprinkler systems, there's water in the plumbing all the way to the sprinkler heads. Well, how does it turn on? Each sprinkler head has a glass bulb with a, a little chemical inside it, or it has a fusible link and the fusible links have solder that melt at certain temperatures, so the bulb or the fusible link rupture at a certain temperature. When it breaks, then there's a little cap that's being held in place by it that falls off, and now the water will come out of the hole in the sprinkler head. It hits the deflector, which is the part that, that shoots the water out into like an umbrella a circle around the sprinkler head and it'll come out at the rate that it's set to come out. That's a wet pipe system and how it works. In a dry pipe system there isn't water in all of the pipe but the sprinkler heads are the exact same. So what's important that you understand with both a wet pipe and a dry pipe system only the sprinkler heads that are exposed to the heat are going to open up and water come out. So the water only comes out where the fire is, where the heat is. So they're both similar in that sense. The sprinkler heads work the same way. The main difference is that there's a valve and you can see the blow up of that uh, valve there and on one side, you've got water pressure. On the other side of the valve, there's air pressure. And there's air pressure throughout all of the pipe in the building on the air side. So the air pressure has to be greater than the water pressure to hold that valve down. What happens is one of the sprinkler heads pops because of heat, and then the uh, cover falls off, the air comes out because it's under pressure, and as soon as the air comes out, that valve will be pushed open by the water pressure on the other side. The water will fill the whole plumbing system, but will only come out those sprinkler heads that have popped. The downside is it's slower. So there's another kind of system called PREACT we'll talk about in a second, but first, deluge. Deluge systems are different than wet pipe and dry pipe in that they're only used for small portions of the building, usually over specific equipment. And in deluge systems, the pipe is dry and the sprinkler heads are open. So when the sprinkler system turns on, which I'll explain to you in a second how it happens, the water comes out every sprinkler head. Now, these are not used in whole buildings, so unlike Bruce Willis movies and Die Hard and all of that kind of stuff, you don't, uh, there isn't a system that exists where you set your, um, lighter, uh, you know, cigarette lighter by a sprinkler head and it pops open and waters everywhere in the whole building. That doesn't exist. Um, what happens with this system is there's either smoke or heat detectors and you see in your top left it says electric detectors. 
The detectors sense the heat or the smoke. They send a message to the fire alarm control panel. The fire alarm goes off and the message goes to the sprinkler system where there's a, um, man, uh, a, a, a automatic valve that is going to get opened automatically. There's no air pressure in there. The water's just going to shoot into the pipe and it's going to come out every single sprinkler head. Now remember how that works because PREACT is kind of similar. So PREACT is a combination of a deluge system and a dry pipe system. In a PREACT, the sprinkler heads are closed though, unlike deluge. They're like the dry pipe, but there's no air pressure in there. There's just regular air. And uh, there's a check valve and a, a valve that holds the water back like the deluge. So the valve is similar. But what we're going to do here is the problem with dry pipe is it, it, it's a slow process by the time all the air pressure comes out and then the water comes in, there's a delay. So here we're going to set these detectors at a lower temperature than the sprinkler head. So if the sprinkler head is a 165, it goes off. We might set the detectors at 125 or 135 or 45. And at that temperature, it opens the valve like the deluge system. But unlike the deluge system, it's going to just go in and hit the sprinkler heads and stop there. Now the system is like a wet pipe system. If the temperature continues to rise, wherever the temperature hits that 165 degrees, the sprinkler head is going to pop water's going to come out and it's already there. There's no delay. So this system, if it turns on, if that valve opens, an alarm will go off and it will notify both the um, fire alarm, uh, the, the place where they monitor, the monitoring company, um, and then it will, from there, uh, they will either call the fire department or call the... Um, the building owner or facilities manager and notify them that the, the sprinkler system has been activated um, and then they'll, they'll take care of it. There's lots of different sprinkler types. Um, the main ones you're going to see are uprights and pendants. There's, uh, there's a kind called early suppression, fast response, extended coverages, there's larger drops, there's old style, there's open style. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, a lot of the different kinds, but here, let's look at some different uh, variations. There's uh, corrosion resistant, there's dry institutional, there's even sprinkler heads that are used in the racks of storage places, and then there's ornamental kinds that are made to look nice. But really what we want to know about sprinkler heads is this. We have concealed heads which are hidden up in the ceiling with a little white cover on them. Uh, this is what you're going to see in modern home sprinkler systems. Uh, flush is where it's perfectly flush with the ceiling. Concealed, there's a little cap there and you can see the cap. But the main types are pendant, sidewall, and upright. Pendants hang down, uprights, hmm, they face up. That's the way to remember. Uprights face up, pendants hang down, and then sidewall, uh, you know, they're on the wall, and the side of the wall. The guy who named this, he's a genius. Um, sidewall sprinklers you're usually going to see in hotels um, and uh, other places where it's practical. Uh, don't ever hang your clothing from a sidewall sprinkler. Many a, a bride has hang, hung her wedding dress from them thinking, oh, this is, I don't want my dress to get all wrinkled. So they go and they hang it from there. And if they hit that little bulb with the hanger, they break it. Black water comes out, ruins their dress, ruins the room. It's horrible. Yeah, don't do that. 
As of 2012, we now have uh, residential sprinklers required throughout the state of California in any new home. Uh, now, there's water spray systems, and the difference between water spray and sprinkler systems is just a smaller drop. And they use these sometimes where there's hazardous materials or for electrical equipment where they don't want the, the equipment deluged with water, but they want a finer, uh, mistier spray. Uh, in fact, the difference between sprinklers and water spray is the sign of the drops. The difference between water spray and water mist is a much smaller drop. In fact, we wouldn't even call it a mist, uh, a, a drop. We would call it mist or like steam. In water mist, it's filling the room with, with what appears to be steam. And you might have a system like this in your backyard for keeping people cool. This is a much more uh, intricate system and um, a lot more pressure, much more reliable than the ones that you have at home. Um, and these are used sometimes in a computer and equipment rooms, but I would rather use a gas system in a computer room. Flammable, combustible mess, uh, uh, liquids. Where you do see them sometimes is aircraft, passenger cabins, and cruise ships. Um, and the military uses these uh, in a lot of their ships. And then, as I mentioned before, we have foam water system, which is uh, water that goes into uh, uh, goes through the plumbing and then mixes with Class A foam or Class B foam. Usually, it's going to be Class B because these are used for hazardous materials and flammable liquids. You can see them in aircraft hangars, bulk petroleum facilities, flammable liquid loading racks. They're pretty cool. Um, you can look at this YouTube link if you want. It's uh, pretty awesome the way they work. Um, and then uh, they fill the room up or they fill the tanks up if it's petroleum uh, with foam. Uh, there are, are standpipes, which are mostly for firefighters to fight fire. This is the last of our water-based systems other than extinguishers. Um, it, it's designed for manual fire suppression. So either the fire department is going to connect their hose to it, or there are systems that are set up so that people, uh, occupants, hopefully trained personnel, will use them. There's three classes of standpipes. Uh, class one, and here's how I remember them. Class one uh, are first class. Um, uh, because uh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Class one are for firefighters because firefighters are first class. Okay? Uh, class one standpipe systems are for firefighters because we're going to connect our hose to them. It's under higher pressure um, if... Occupants use the hose and these systems, they'd probably get knocked on their can. You got to be trained how to use this. They're usually going to have a two and a half uh, fitting uh, with a, um, a fitting that takes it down to inch and a half and they'll have a cover on them. So there are procedures to using these. You want to use it right and uh, set it up right. Uh, class 2 is for occupants, and it has pre-connected hose to it, pre-connected nozzles. A lot of times these nozzles get stolen, though. They're much less reliable. Sometimes the hose is uh, uh, a little questionable, might be um, uh, deteriorated or rotted. So uh, firefighters usually don't use these. They're very unreliable. We use them if we have to. Um, if it's life or death, you might want to try and use one of these, but we would much rather use our own hose. La uh, so, uh, I forgot to say, so class one is for firefighters because firefighters are first class. Class two is for you, the public, okay? Class three is for you and me. It's for the public and for the firefighter. So class three, if you look at this picture in the top left, that is the uh, connection for the fire hose that's for public usage um, that's connected to a nozzle. It's going to be at a much lower gallons per minute and a much lower pressure, but it will work for the public if they grab it. 
Now the bottom left, we can see that's the connection for firefighters so that they can connect their hose to that and they'll have much higher pressure, much more gallons per minute. And of course, uh, you can see here in this uh, cabinet, they added a, a, an extinguisher as well. That's not required, but that's what was in this uh, particular picture. There's uh, five different kinds, automatic wet, automatic dry, semi-automatic dry, manual dry, and manual wet. And these are just different ways. Where, uh, if you have a, um, a stamp pipe in an outdoor uh, parking structure, you don't want to have a wet system. You don't want people being able to open it and water going everywhere. You also are more subject to the temperatures um, but what's probably going to be used is a manual dry system where the fire department has to connect to the fire department connection, pump water into it, then firefighters go to the outlets at the proper floor and area where the car fire is or whatever and connects to it and then gets the water through their hose. Because of uh, these are used a lot in high-rise building, a lot of them have to have pressure restricting or pressure control devices because at the different elevations, we're going to have different pressure based on resisting gravity or dropping down from tanks on the top of the building, having too much pressure as it goes down with gravity. So we have these regulators. Now, uh, the, the problem with high rises is getting the right pressure and the amount of water to the higher floors. So uh, usually they are, well, always they're going to require to have fire pumps in conjunction uh, with the sprinkler system and the standpipes. Um, and there's a lot of different kinds. Here's a horizontal split case fire pump. This is probably the most common. Um, the shaft's going to move horizontally with the pump motor and it's going to pick up the pressure and push it up to the higher floors. Um, there are vertical split case fire pumps which are similar but now it's vertical instead of horizontal. Um, you can also have vertical inline fire pumps where these inline pumps boost it as it goes up in elevation and vertical turbine fire pumps end suction fire pumps where it pulls the water. And lastly, but quite important in high rise are jockey pumps where at the different levels, as you know, we get up to the 60th floor or whatever, we got to push it up higher. So we're going to have jockey pumps that are now going to push it up to uh, the adequate pressure for those higher floors. Um, and now how are they going to be driven? Usually they're, they're electric but the electricity oftentimes goes out in fires, so they're going to be backed up by a diesel generator. <laughs> um, diesel's more expensive, has more maintenance, a uh, little less reliable. Um, and steam may be back east. You might see those in older buildings. Uh, the pump controllers are, again, going to be electric, um, and they start and stop the pumps automatically. But again, they're going to be backed up, even if you have an electric system um, that's going to be backed up by some kind of a generator. All of these systems have to be maintained and checked out every five years and there's monthly checks, annual checks, and then every five years by trained personnel who perform maintenance and any repairs necessary. We're almost done guys. Let's just talk about extinguishers. Well, Class A extinguishers are for Class A fires like wood, hay, stubble, paper, common combustibles. Uh, they're rated 1A through 40A and that has to do with the amount of uh, product that it can put out or the area. The larger, larger extinguishers are going to be tested with these wood cribs and sometimes they're tested on a wood panel or Excelsior. Uh, Class B fire extinguishers are for flammable liquids, Class B fires. So the numbers are going to indicate the square footage of area of flammable liquid that can be extinguished with that type of extinguisher. 
So a lot of times when you have your combo extinguishers, it'll say uh, 2A, 10 BC. And uh, that has to do with the area that can put out if it's an A or 10 uh, would have to do with the t square footage of the fire with flammable liquids that it could extinguish. For Class C fire extinguishers, there's no numerical ratings because all we're concerned about here is, is the product conductive or not? So some of our dry chems are conductive, so you got to look at it. Make sure if it's only an AB extinguisher, don't assume that every dry chem is going to be ABC. Nowadays, most of them are, but some of them are just AB, so don't, don't use an AB extinguisher on a Class C fire. For Class C fires, usually we're going to have CO2 or a dry chem that is ABC. For Class D, there are fire extinguishers out there. Usually they're rather large. Some of them are on wheels. But uh, a lot of times with uh, flammable metal fires, uh, it's literally a barrel of this product. And the people who work in these uh, uh, facilities where they cut flammable metals, or whether on a lathe or, or uh, any other kinds of, of usages, um, they're going to have like this product that they just scoop it up and they throw it on it. Because, you know, you think about it on a lathe, you're using oil and then a flammable metal and the lathing process is very hot. So sometimes in their shavings or cuttings on the floor, they can catch little little fires going. And if they don't catch it right away with the some of the Class D product, um, they're going to have a problem on their hands. Class K is for kitchen fires. K is in kitchen, and it's a wet agent. Uh, if you've ever picked one of these up, any of you who work in restaurants, uh, ask your chef or your manager if you can just take a look at the fire extinguisher. If you pick it up off of the hanger, you'll find it's a lot heavier than you think it would be, and that's because it has a wet cam in it, and it's quite heavy. Um, it's a lot heavier than a dry cam extinguisher. And these are uh, to be used in kitchens where there are fryer fires. The extinguishing agents, uh, there's a lot of different kinds. Water, CO2, foam, chem, and clean agent. Water's most common, uh, and we're going to use it in all of our water-based systems, but also with water extinguishers. Uh, they're kind of cool to use. Uh, I have a picture of one here in a couple of slides. CO2 is really good. It puts out the fire by suffocating it. It displaces the oxygen. So you don't want to be in a, a flooding system of CO2 because it's lethal to humans. Um, it's going to push off. It's not the CO2 that's going to kill you. It's the fact that it pushes all the oxygen out. Here's another link for you to uh, check out. Um, it's kind of cool how CO2 flooding systems work, but there's CO2 extinguishers too, and CO2 itself is a propellant. And so it, when it's going from liquid to gas, it, it has pressure with it. So sometimes we use CO2 to propel the dry cam product out of an extinguisher. Um, then we also have foam, which are different concentrates that are added to water. And we have, you know, the big systems, but we also have foam extinguishers. And then, of course, there's dry chem, uh, which are little particles, uh, little powders, and uh, the frequently used agents are sodium bicarb, potassium bicarb, and all those others there. Wet chem is uh, relatively new. It's been used in kitchens for fryers in professional kitchens um, because the newer oils that are used uh, are really hard to put out. Um, they, they run at very high temperatures, so wet chem will smother it and put it out. Dry chem won't necessarily put the fire out. And then there are, are gases, clean agent gases. They leave no residue. They are great for computer rooms, big server rooms. They're non-conductive, and uh, they 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 either attack the the uh, fire tetrahedron or they choke out the fire. 
So there's a couple of different ways to expel the ex uh, product out of the extinguishers. Um, the top left picture, that's a, a water-based, we used to call them water cannons. Um, it, you put the water into a certain level and then you use an air pressure just like you're pumping up a tire and you put air pressure in there. These are great for water fights and driving down the street and spraying people. At least that's what I used to do with them when I was a kid, but uh, don't tell anybody I told you to do that. Um, they're, they're, they're kind of fun to have. Uh, I used to have two of them and I sold them in a garage sale and I've regretted it ever since. Uh, then there's cartridge operated. That's the top right picture. And that's a CO2 cartridge that's going to push out the dry cam that's in the bigger red uh, portion of the extinguisher. Um, and don't see very often pump operated extinguishers. Uh, wildland firefighters use pump operated water extinguishers where uh, they can, you know, use it out in the middle of nowhere. They fill a bag or uh, the can, we prefer to be bags because they're lighter, uh, with water and then they have a little pump action and they can use it. Uh, extinguishers should be placed four inches off the ground, no higher than five feet unless they're higher in weight than they're supposed to be a little bit further down. NFPA 10 tells us the spacing and distribution of fire extinguishers, uh, at least 75 feet apart uh, for the most part, even if it's light, ordinary, or, or uh, extra heavy um, fire hazards. Uh, 75 feet apart, and the ratings should be 2A, 4A, and you know, the, the whole NFPA 10 will tell you all of those things. Last slide. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry this took just over an hour. Um, proper location has to be inspected on a regular basis, that the extinguisher is not blocked from access, that all the parts are there, the, the inspection tag, the nozzle, the horn, the lock pin, that it's not damaged, that it's got the right product in it. L look at the pressure gauge, make sure it's at the proper uh, pressure, and ensure it's all properly hung, that the signage is there, you know, a sign above it with extinguisher and an arrow uh, facing down, unless it's very, very visible. Um, and all of these things need to be checked on a monthly and an annual basis. The annual maintenance is done by a professional. The monthly inspection is done by the building owner or whoever he designates or she designates. Sorry this was so long, you guys, uh, but hopefully it helps you understand all of this stuff.